Hi, I'm Mali, Hana, and everyone tuning in. Uh, my name is Tanika Haywell Jennings. I'm a Korean American adoptee and an advisory board member and a volunteer with Adoptees for Justice. Um, Adoptees for Justice, also known as A4J, is a project of NACASAC. Um, and as you know, NACASAC is the host of this new series called Why Asians Should Care. Today, we'll be talking about why Asians should care about citizenship for adoptees, how this fits into NACASAC's push for citizenship for all, about the Adoptee Citizenship Act, um, which is legislation currently introduced in Congress to address this issue. Emily, could you introduce yourself next? Yeah. My name is Emily Warnicke. Um, I'm an international adoptee. I was adopted in 1964 at three months old in South Korea. Um, the parents that adopted me, they flew to South Korea. I'm from a military family. My father served in World War II. Um, I was told all my life I was naturalized through the process of my adoption. I was married to an American. I have a son that's 41. And I got in some trouble and I found out I was not a citizen. Um, I worked through a work permit. I'm under deportation. Um, I, I got disabled with a spine disease. I'm not able to receive my full benefits. So I, it impacts me that I'm not able to get my full benefits and every year I have to apply for a work permit. And sometimes the senator in California has to expedite it, which doesn't make sense. But I don't get the rights as of any as other, well, the citizens. So um, I, I go through a lot um, financially and and that's how my life has been. Thanks, Emily. Um, Hannah, do you want to introduce yourself too? Um, yes. My name is Hannah Jung Park. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm a Korean American adoptee and a recent law school graduate. I was brought to the U.S. at a young age by my biological aunt and uncle, and they legally adopted me here in the United States. Uh, my adoptive mother is a U.S. citizen, and my adoptive father is a legal permanent resident. After my adoption was finalized, uh, my parents did not hire an immigration attorney. Um, so there were mistakes in my documents, uh, which meant delays and rejections. I eventually aged out and ended up in removal proceedings. Um, I reapplied yet again, but as an adult, um, the wait time was much, much longer. Meanwhile, I faced deportation and could not stay in the US legally. Um, eventually, I voluntarily departed to South Korea. I waited many, many years um, and then went through a very complicated uh, visa process before being allowed to re-enter um, the United States as a legal permanent resident um, to finally reunite with my family. Hannah and Emily, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about both of your backgrounds um, and again, for being willing to have this conversation together with me. While the three of us are all Korean adoptees, we know that there are many adoptees who've been um, adopted to the U.S. from a range of other countries, including countries across Europe, Asia, Central and South America, and Africa. And because of a significant lack of oversight and failures of many individuals and systems, tens of thousands of our fellow adoptees, adoptees being people who are adopted to the U.S. from countries other than where they were born, do not have their U.S. citizenship, even though they were adopted just like us as children by U.S. citizen parents. I think at this point, it might be helpful to provide a brief overview of U.S. intercountry adoption. I'll try to make this really fast, um, but informative, hopefully. Um, intercountry adoption to the U.S. really started at the close of World War II, 
Um, that said, intercountry adoption to the US took off in full force after the Korean War in the 1950s, when a number of legislation, um, led pieces of legislation were advocated for by US citizen parents so that they could bring over um, children from Korea. We call this like a first wave of adoption from South Korea. Uh, many of these first wave adoptive parents were members of the military, some of whom had served themselves in the Korean War. So basically from this time in the 1950s all the way to 2001, the US government completely failed to pass any legislation surrounding citizenship or guaranteeing citizenship for intercountry adoptees. That is a total of more than five decades of children being brought to the United States with the promise, as we all know, of this new, you know, quote unquote, better life. But in fact, many of us not receiving even the most basic rights of citizenship. Congress finally did pass the Child Citizenship Act of 2000, which attempted to address this grave oversight in adoption and immigration law. Um, Hannah, would you be willing to share a little bit more about the Child Citizenship Act? Um, yes, so um, the Child Citizenship Act um, passed in 2000 um, and it grants citizenship to adoptees of US citizens. Um, but this law had a very arbitrary cutoff date and other qualifying factors. Um, so it left out many adoptees um, including adoptees born before February 28, 1983. And it only includes um, adoptees who initially entered the US under certain visa categories. Um, so while the, citizen, uh, the Child Citizenship Act um, streamlined the process for many adoptees, it wasn't an inclusive bill and it failed to consider all US adoptees. So the sad reality is many adoptees um, have been excluded and um, many do not have a path to citizenship. Um, so with this in mind, um, Emily, can you share a little bit of, about your story and the difficulties um, that adoptees without citizenship face currently? Uh, yes, um, adoptees that don't have citizenship, some are deported, um, for crimes that they did, but they all grew up thinking they were, they were naturalized. Um, it's sad to say that a lot of uh, international adoptees were adopted to families that were abused sexually, physically, and emotionally, or they, they never had a, a child service person come out to check on them. So they've been impacted um, emotionally um, through this. Um, we even have adoptees that served in our U.S. military that was deported. Um, also, uh, you know, it, it, it it's so sad. We need we need to bring them home. Um, it's it's for me. It's 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 really hard when I look at a lot of the stories and know some of the people, it's heartbreaking that they have to go to a country they don't know of. And I'm sure that uh, we, uh, if you don't know, there was an adoptee that was deported at 47 years old and committed suicide. Um, he was sent back. See, he was rooted. You can't root and grow somebody up in U.S. soil, and then say, you know what, we're going to send you back to your country. So Congress, our government needs to step up and do the right thing. Um, um, thank you for sharing that, Emily. Um, we know that this is an extremely difficult situation um, that many adoptees go through. Um, some of the other difficulties um, that come to mind are family separ separation, deportation and detention and just, you know, um, basic human rights and um, maintenance of just basic dignity. Um, the United States just unfortunately does not have affordable healthcare. Um, and um, many places throughout the United States lack um, safe mass transportation systems. I mean, I could just go on and on about 
um, a lot of the services and the access that we need to, you know, live and thrive. Um, and without programs and structures that support people to survive, um, it's just really hard for many of us, um, whether you are a citizen or not. Um, and if you don't have citizenship, um, things are much, much harder. Thank you so much for shedding light, um, Hannah and Emily, on some of the, you know, huge challenges that adoptees without citizenship face. Um, it's unbelievable, um, but there's a lot of reasons that these things actually happen. Um, at Adoptees for Justice, we interact with adoptees without citizenship on pretty much a daily basis um, who share their stories with us. Some of the things we've heard are that many parents actually weren't aware of all the steps in the naturalization process. Um, in some cases, they were given incorrect or incomplete information by government agencies like USCIS or by their own attorneys. So there are adoptees who were told, their parents were told that the process was finalized after they were adopted, that they had done everything they needed. And in reality, that was actually not true. And again, this happened particularly a lot of times um, we hear about it from military families um, who really just believed that they had done all the steps to naturalize their children when in fact there was something remaining. Unfortunately, um, we also do know of, like Emily was saying, some cases where there are parents who were aware of their responsibility to naturalize their children but chose not to do it. Sometimes the parents just didn't realize the importance of this. But in other cases, parents did withhold citizenship intentionally as a form of abuse. And sometimes um, adoptees who faced these kind of situations at home were relinquished back into the state, might have had to go through multiple different homes growing up and still never got citizenship. Um, so just a lot of different reasons. And again, we can see systemic failure on all different sides from the beginning of adoptees coming here and not being guaranteed citizenship and every step along the way. You know, growing up as a kid, because my family, even though my father served World War II, he adopted the first three adoptees with Tokyo, Japan. Um, and then there was two international adoptees from South Korea. Coming up as a child, um, fitting in a Caucasian family and a Caucasian community, there was a lot of racism, a lot of bigotry. Um, being a child, we don't understand why we can't walk down the street. We're being called names. They let their dogs out. They spit in our face. And it's really hard, even going to school. Um throughout school, not, you know, why are your parents white? Why are you Asian? And the bad thing about it is, I mean, it just impacts us all. Um, the way so society is, how we are treated as an adoptee. Um, as far as other impacted adoptees, I, my heart goes out to them. Um, the stories of the abuse that they, they've been through and they've been deported. And it's not just South Korea, it's, it's many other countries. Um, but for me, I remember what through the pandemic, I was at Walmart and it never clicked to me. Um, I, if somebody drove by, they were screaming out their car, telling, be, you need to go back to your country, you killer. We don't want you here. And it didn't click to me that we were in the pandemic, but you know, they all think we look alike. But I, I really think our Asian community needs to come together as one. We need to support one another. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I think a lot of the things, Emily, that you are sharing sound to me like those individual instances of racism. Um, and the reality we know is unfortunately that a lot of our immigration and adoption policy is also, you know, there is 
we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but there is a link as well, right? Um, when it comes to racism um, and the things we experience individually all hint at the systemic reality that we're living in that guides all of our policies and systems. Um, regardless of intention, the truth is that the US has made a big mistake, um, both in its initial lacking of ensuring that uh, adoptees got citizenship when they were adopted by US citizen parents um, to attempting to, but not fully correcting this error um, when Congress cut out adoptees who are over the age of 18 from the Child Citizenship Act of 2000. Adoptees for Justice regularly meets with uh, members of Congress offices and a range of community members, stakeholders, including adoptees, adopted families, faith and education leaders, Asian American and immigrant uh, rights advocacy groups. Across the board, people are just shocked and horrified to find out about the fact that so many adoptees lack citizenship and they wanna know what they can do to help. And our main ask for members of Congress and community members alike is to take action to advance passage of the Adoptee Citizenship Act this year. Um, so regarding the act, um, can you tell us what the Adoptee Citizenship Act is, Tanika? Yes, I can. <laughs> Um, the Adoptee Citizenship Act, uh, we call it the ACA sometimes too, although I know that could be confusing, um, is a common sense bill. Um, and it's, uh, it's a common sense bill, it could be an amendment. It's a bill that simply changes the effective date of the Child Citizenship Act to ensure that it includes all adoptees regardless of age. If it's passed and enacted into law, the Adoptee Citizenship Act will resolve the technical oversight that resulted from that arbitrary age cutoff in the Child Citizenship Act. Having amassed an incredible wide bipartisan support over the course of a number of different Congresses, the ACA was finally positioned um, to pass and it did pass the US House in February of this year as part of the America Competes Act. Um, unfortunately, Congress recently passed a slimmer version of the final package through the Senate um, and back through the House. This bill is known as CHIPS, Chips and Science Act. And sadly, the Adoptee Citizenship Act, as well as many other provisions that passed the U.S. House as part of the Competes Act, was not, they were not included um, in the CHIPS Act. At this point, we know that the House has the congressional support needed to pass our bill this Congress. What we really need now is the Senate, in particular, a small number of key members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. We need them to agree to vote to pass our bill this year. Um, while our bill could pass as a standalone bill, we also have at least one more opportunity for Congress to include it in a broader bill package. Um, that would be the omnibus bill toward the end of this year. So what are we asking Congress to do? We are asking Congress to exercise humanity, basic human decency to put aside partisan politics um, and prioritize getting our bill done um, in order to correct the harms of the past and to fulfill some of the promises that were made to adoptees and to our families. We don't want to see any more families, not even one, be separated um, because of lack of citizenship. Um, our message is clear too, as we are organizing across the country with our broader coalitions, including hundreds of supporting organizations, we have to fight for a bill that includes all people. Um, Emily, can you share a little bit more with us? I know you did before, but just like, again, why is it so important that our bill um, includes deported adoptees? The bill for deported adoptees, um, first of all, they, it's, you're grown. You've been in the U.S. all your life. You know nothing about the culture. So you're shipped to a country unknown to you. It's hard for them to survive. It's hard for them to even get work, food, or even a place to sleep. This is why it's important to bring them all back home. Um, you know, I, 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 my, God forbid, 
I don't think that any international adoptee should have never been deported out of this country when they were brought here so young, you know, and just sit back. That's like me uh, taking the president and, and sending him to another country and say, this is where you have to live now at a, at a, at a grown age. But they're so impacted, the ones that have been deported, that this is why this bill is very important, not just for myself, because it, I, they need to bring them back home. They're suffering and they're they're going through so much and we're trying to do the best we can, our organization to help them. Thank you for sharing all that, Emily. Absolutely. Um, at this point, I think people um, in the conversation, people often ask us like, so it's very logical, it makes sense, it's the right thing to do. Why hasn't the Adoptee Citizenship Act passed? Um, and this is where we get back to sort of like, what is guiding systems and policies in our country? Uh, to understand why our bill hasn't passed, we have to ask ourselves, how and why was it that adoptees were even allowed to be adopted to the US from other countries in the first place without the guarantee of our basic citizenship rights? And again, the sad reality is that the history of intercountry adoption is steeped in a history of colonization, imperialism, enforced military and intervention in other sovereign nations around the world, including South Korea, uh, which resulted in the forced migration of many people, not just us, but including intercountry adoptees. Um, for the US, um, this history is rooted, we have to say it, in the twin forces of white supremacy and anti-Blackness, which are deeply rooted in the US very foundation and foundational policies. As a result of this, immigrants, especially those who are not white, Black, Brown, Asian, Indigenous communities are seen as perpetual foreigners whose access to very basic human rights like citizenship is simply not guaranteed. Um, this means we have a steep uphill climb in order to impress upon our nation's leaders, like the president, as Emily mentioned, and members of Congress, that we as intercountry adoptees of diverse races and ethnicities are worthy and deserving of our full humanity. So now let's get to the title and the purpose of this video. Hannah? Um, yes, so I'd like to talk about why um, Asians should care about this issue. Um, you know, citizenship is a bigger issue than just um, individuals. Um, and we all know that there are currently 11 million undocumented immigrants here in the United States. Um, home is here. We've all put down our roots here. And um, for millions and millions of um, immigrants here in America um, who do not have citizenship, um, while we um, contribute, um, millions of people are still excluded from vital rights um, resources and um, they all live, they all deserve to live um, dignified lives. Um, many times, you know, they live in fear and even if they may qualify for some sort of state benefits, um, there's always that undercurrent or underlying fear. Oh, if I um, somehow um, get a little bit of help um, that may you know, um, bring some negative consequences and prevent me from, you know, gaining immigration status. It's the system is built as if um, it's some sort of a huge um, reward that we don't deserve. And the fact of the matter is um, immigrants do deserve um, basic human rights and to live um, freely in this country. Um, so with that, um, 
um, Tanika, can you tell us more or can we maybe continue this discussion on um, why Asians should care more about this issue? Sure. Um, I think one really kind of simple answer in a way is that a significant number of impacted adoptees without citizenship are Asian American, um, just due to waves and patterns in intercountry adoption and migration to the US. Um, Asians in this country, whether we were adopted or not, we've all been impacted by that history of global imperialism and colonization in which the US has historically and still continues to play a leading role today. Um, and as you were saying, Hannah, part of that, oh, hello, kitty. Um, part of that um, is also, <laughs> we love the cat. Part of that is also the um, exclusionary nature of you know, citizenship in this country. Um, and so as Asian Americans and as adoptees, uh, we share a lot of things in common. Um, I think like Emily was saying earlier, we face stigma, we experience um, xenophobia, you know, fear of people who are seen as different and being treated not just at an individual level, but, but in policies and systems as perpetual foreigners, um, even in our own home, in our own home country. Um, yeah, I, I just think as people who have been impacted, even if sometimes we only feel like, oh, I was impacted a little, right? Like a microaggression, we have to recognize the systemic realities we live in. And it's our responsibility to stand up for the people in our communities who've been most impacted by those same injustices. Uh, we all know this, right, probably, but it's worth saying again, uh, the truth is not what our systems and policies tell us. The truth is that we are all deserving of full humanity. Um, and that cannot and should not be contingent on our ability to leverage some kind of privilege that we have or fulfill any kind of stereotype of us as Asian Americans, as model minorities. Um, and the only way to really confront that and to move beyond that is to stand up for each other and demand that every member of our community is treated with dignity and respect and have full citizenship. Emily, why do you think that Asians should care about adoptee citizenship? Um, I believe that all Asian communities, I don't care what nationality or what country you are from, because we're all impacted. Um, you know, we need to come together as one. Like I said, I, I've been raised up with Japanese siblings and uh, Korean, but you know, when it comes down to, especially with racism and bigotry, um, they think we all look alike. It doesn't matter. But I, I think that our Asian community needs to come into together as one whole. And we need to stand up and rise up and fight together. Thank you, Emily. Absolutely. Um, and for everyone who's joined us today, uh, from Emily, Hannah, and me, we want to thank you for joining us in this conversation and remind you to please remember to subscribe to NACASAC's YouTube channel. Um, if you're wondering how you can take action, that is wonderful. Um, there are several ways that you can join us in the fight for citizenship for adoptees as part of the fight for citizenship for all. One, you can donate to Adoptees for Justice or Adoptees Without Citizenship. Um, there's a link in the caption on your screen. You can contact your members of Congress today or tomorrow if you can't do it today, but right away and let them know that you as a constituent, as a resident in their district care about this issue. That's the number one thing that will move them to take action. And of course, we urge you to reach out to Asian American organizations, immigrant organizations that you know of, that you're part of in your area um, and networks and encourage them to get activated on this issue. When we show that tons of people care about this issue, that it's an adoptee issue, it's an Asian American issue, it's an immigrant issue, that is when our member of, members of Congress will take action um, and we need them to pass the Adoptee Citizenship Act this year. Um, so thank you once again. Um, and I think that's all for us.